Welcome to another episode of SCP Cafe. I'm your host, Blue Soul, and this is 2019, Week 5. It's Friday, everybody. We made it. A lot to cover this week. Got five really good skips I want to get into. Uh, we are just leaving the cliche contest. We are uh, closed to entries at this point. So now comes the time of voting. So you have until uh, February 15th to get your votes in. There's there's a race up at the top between 4205 and 1322J. Those have both been covered in SCP Cafe if you want to look back through previous episodes. So 14 days and counting, and we will crown a winner of Cliché-Con 2019. Wanted to give a shout out to the uh, Spotify types, you guys that subscribe via Spotify. I'm now uh, over 100 followers there. Uh, that's way ahead of all of the other channels. Uh, iTunes is sitting at about 60, YouTube sitting at like 23. Uh, and then, you know, there's always the on-demand listening on the scp.cafe website. But certainly if you, uh, if you've been enjoying this, I, I would, uh, I'd appreciate it if you, if you gave it a follow and that'll keep you, uh, informed when these get posted on, uh, Friday evenings, not to mention anything else that we might get up to over the course of the week. And, and speaking of things that we might be getting up to, um, I have some, big plans that I'm hoping to, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to reveal them, uh, somewhere, let's say within the next two to four weeks. Um, I, uh, I'm excited for, uh, where this is all headed. Um, hopefully you guys will be too. Now, like I said, this has been a, uh, busy week as far as skips. There were a ton posted. There were, uh, 32 of them, uh, early uh thursday and then i think another four or five snuck in uh under the radar at the last minute so there were something like 36 to 38 articles uh to to sort through of them about 18 to 19 were in scope and i have uh, narrowed that down to five and uh as as usual you know, this, these aren't necessarily the top five highest rated, but they're ones that I think are uh, interesting and have some things that are worth discussing. We're going to kick things off this week with the long boy of the week. This is SCP-4760, titled The Other Eye, and written by my good friend DJ Cactus. Uh, first thing you see when you when you uh, visit 4760 is the... Uh, this is something that I have not really discussed up to this point, though it's been going on for about a month, and that is uh, what... Cactus and a couple of other members are working on as far as a new theme for the site, not just uh, a recolor of the header like you sometimes see with custom CSS. This is a, an attempt at at a full on redesign of the of the site of the the menus, the styling of just about everything has been touched, and this has come a very long way in a very short amount of time. Um, this is something I've been wanting to contribute to. There just have not been enough hours in the day to to kind of do my part. But uh, this is one of uh, one of quite a few. I would say there's probably a couple dozen articles at this point that have incorporated the uh, this new look, uh, new SCP theme. And to to be clear, this is not an official theme, uh, but it's being designed in hopes that uh, tech may look at this as a replacement for the existing uh, Sigma 9 theme. Uh, it's possible, you know, as as things get a little farther along, uh, you know, it, it, it has to, you know, check a lot of boxes. It's, you know, it's going to be pretty rigorously tested, but uh, sure, you know, if it if it meets all of those, all those things and people seem to like it more then you know, we could certainly go that route. Um, but that's getting away from the matter at hand. And I got to say, this skip is quite long enough as it is. So we're going to get going. And, uh, this will be, uh, <laughs> I've said in the past that I'm going to try to do condensed versions of skips and try and, you know, uh, last week, uh, one that I was like, uh, we'll see if I can get this under a half hour. I am, boy, this thing's big. I'm hoping to keep it under half an hour. I'm hoping to keep it under 45 minutes. If I'm being honest with myself, I'm going to aim to get this down under, uh, let's say 20. Uh, you're greeted at the top by a header that says by order of the overseer council, uh, the following file describes an unknown and dangerous man-made anomalous threat involving a hostile person or group of interest and is level four slash 4760 classified unauthorized access is forbidden. And then we go into, uh, all this stuff, the object class of Euclid and, uh, 
sort of a, it, this is the the more modern look i've seen some some uh, skips attempt the uh the content is all fixed width but uh more centered on the page um we have a wide uh image block of uh what looks like a, a coastline uh of a forest where it meets the sea and it says edge of scp 4760 exclusion zone and uh, there's another image uh, off to uh, down and to the right of it of uh, the caption reads Graham Island, uh, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, we've got some crosshairs pointing at a little uh, thing on uh, in the middle of a uh, what looks like a, a park. The containment procedures indicate that uh, 4760 is contained in its original location. Uh, we have not yet been able to move it, but engineers are still looking into the feasibility of doing so. And Foundation Protocol Falcon 22, <laughs> Falcons in all caps, and I mentioned this in uh, one of the channels, that I'm a, I'm a total sucker for uh, intentionally vague, military-esque, all caps code names for projects and operations and stuff. So, uh, uh Foundation Protocol Falcon 22, uh, uh, it, it apparently sets out that this is how we create an exclusionary zone around the skip and that uh, during activation cycles of the skip, no personnel are permitted uh, into this zone. Uh, entering the zone is almost immediately fatal and people who don't pass through the established barrier before the beginning of a cycle are considered lost. And uh, the protocol also dictates means by which the activation cycle can be detected. It involves a series of concentric rings of bird cages, each containing a single canary. Uh, and the system is spaced, uh, it's 10 rings, each spaced about 72 meters from each other with 12 cages in each ring. And basic mechanical pressure switches in the floors of the cages are to monitor for activation effects on the birds inside the cages. The switches are attached to small bells, which will sound continuously if the bird hits the floor of the cage with enough force to trigger the mechanism. So this sounds uh, like an old-timey, uh, you know, coal canary that would drop dead and that would let him know to get the hell out of Dodge. Um, we also have a D-class that's to remain seated next to 4760's terminal at all times. And these D-class are instructed to describe on paper what they see on the terminal during the activation cycle whenever it occurs. After the conclusion of one of these cycles, these papers are to be collected and remanded to Site-64 for inspection and research to determine any kind of commonality. Now, given that they've said that this uh, activation cycle is almost immediately fatal and uh, we have a D-class sitting next to it to record things on paper, we can sort of make the assumption of uh, what, what, what exactly is entailed when they say that the papers are to be collected. We're going to go get them, you know, off the D-class's dead body. Um, we've tried to use long-range photographic devices, but the activation cycles create heavy interference, so that's out. Uh, and currently, these activation cycles are expected every 47 days, plus or minus five days, and it has been, and it's uh, it's got little uh, square brackets and bold, and it says 29 days since the last activation cycle. Um, we go to a description, and there's a, uh, another image uh, to the right of this that is a, a bone field. It's just, uh, it's mud, and it's littered with animal corpses, uh, animal skeletons, I should say. There's very little... Uh, flesh or anything on these skeletons uh, and the caption reads animal remains at the edge of scp 4760 exclusion zone so the description is uh it indicates that scp 4760 is a machine located on graham island british columbia canada 4760 was built by poi 1115 vincent anderson supposedly at the request of an unnamed client and that it consists of two primary functions. There's a dash A and a dash B. The dash A is a series of massive tungsten plates seated under the ground beneath dash B, and together the entire structure constitutes a plate roughly 800 meters in diameter, and that parts of the plate appear to be coated in thin layers of various rare metals, as well as carbon, palladium, and iridium. And beneath the plates is a network of small copper tubes that run from various points on the underside of dash A up to an access port beneath dash B. And during an activation cycle, it's believed that these tubes move some sort of gas from the underside of the plates back towards the center of the structure. And dash B is a naked humanoid entity seated on the steel chair in the center of the 4760 dash A array. 
This being is completely hairless and has no eyes, ears, nose, mouth, anus, or other open orifices anywhere on its body. And in the place of eyes, Dash B has two metal ports over each of its eye sockets, attached to which are two metallic cables running from Dash B to a small television on a metal stand nearby. <laughs> that's that's a lot to try and visualize, but uh, I encourage you to give it a shot because uh, that's uh, shoo, uh, that's metal. Um, <laughs> that's really metal. Uh, there, uh, it has no apparent means by which to take in air, but Dash B's chest still rises and falls as if it was breathing. It does not ever consume food or excrete waste, and is otherwise completely still, aside from rare instances in which it reacts to stimuli. And there's a footnote here, and the footnote indicates that these reactions are usually nothing more than twitches and shakes, leading us to be unsure as to whether or not it's actually reacting or making involuntary movements. Uh, aside from this, Dash B is otherwise completely featureless, and though it has been described as being vaguely feminine in appearance, it has no discernible gendered characteristics. So... Seated on a steel chair, I'm envisioning this... You know, This is a who like as much as this would benefit from a from a picture to really sell it i uh, i understand why that would be a little difficult <laughs> to to have a picture of something with no eyes ears nose mouth etc cetera, etc cetera. um so dash a and dash b are part of a system that is believed to have been originally intended for remote viewing so think back briefly to that dash b with uh ports running into its eye sockets that connect to a television like this is a uh, this is really really unsettling stuff to try and visualize um activating 4760 is fatal to any living thing in the area directly above dash a and through means that are currently unknown to foundation thaumatologists the skip is capable of suddenly and violently drawing energy out of living things resulting in their deaths so this kind of explains what the setup that we had with the canaries that uh, during one of these activation cycles, you'd, you know, it would start to pull in this, this energy out of the canaries. They drop to the bottom of their cage and that uh, triggers, you know, enough that we can uh, make the, uh, the connection that one of these activation events is happening. Um, from the moment the skip begins the activation cycle, humans uh, within Dash A generally experience no more than 15 seconds of consciousness before succumbing to the effects, and uh, the bodies show a uniform state of decay, subjects appear dried and withered, with bones and other hard structures becoming brittle and flesh, and meat becoming seized and torn. The results of testing indicate that this process is extremely painful for entities that experience it. <laughs> Gee, you think? Um, and as a result, uh, the area directly above Dash A is devoid of plant life, uh, as the organisms that are planted there uh, do not have enough time to achieve any real growth. So that's a lot to take in. Um, that is, you know, by <laughs> by the, the simple nature of, of SCP, that would be the whole skip, but we have a lot of addendums to get into. Um, we have a discovery log that... Uh, uh, it takes it takes place uh, with a hiking enthusiast and internet personality uh, who was hiking and kayaking in the region, and uh, he uh, found Dash B, and uh, you know it's uh, figures out that it's breathing and fucking creepy, and uh, uh, we go into the addendum two, which is ongoing research and investigation, which indicates that. Uh, this was, uh, we found a lab nearby that was in severe disrepair and was owned by Vincent Anderson. And we make the connection here to Anderson Robotics, which is a, you know, a GOI. And we go to an addendum three that has a series of, uh, uh, we'll call them journal entries. Uh, and they seem to be dated from 1963 to, uh, let's see, 1970. And, uh, they, they list, uh, basically the interactions between, uh, Vincent Anderson and, uh, his interactions with Marshall Carter and Dark, uh, in particular with, uh, Mr. Dark, uh, as they, uh, sort of, uh, try to build this thing to, uh, 
to accommodate MC and D and uh, their desires. Um, Anderson basically indicates that Marshall Carter and Dark are interested in getting into the remote viewing business um, and points out that the SCP Foundation has a machine called the All-Seeing Eye. And, uh, you know, a Anderson said, I don't really, uh, I don't get why we have to go about it this way, but okay, the money spends just fine. So he has a test subject who is a young woman that Anderson Robotics pulled off a street in Southeast Asia who is nearly ready for these ocular implants. And it goes on that, uh, you know, it's part, it's a partial success. The girl, uh, got the ocular implants and, you know, had to remove the eyes to fit them in, but eh, that's progress. Um, and the issue now is that Mr. Dark doesn't just want to trust, uh, Callisto. Uh, she, he would rather, uh, see for himself what they're seeing. So they are still kind of looking into, uh, options. We go from there, uh, to, new high higher grade implants that immediately overwhelm Callisto and uh we have to find a way to supplement her energy uh with an additional power source and uh he envisions a set of photosensitive panels that can draw power from the sun the same way civilian solar operates uh though we need to figure out a way to augment it because modern panels are terribly inefficient this is written in 1964 so yeah uh, modern solar was uh uh, very much a pipe dream at that point in time. Um, it, it, we keep going and uh, had some success and says that uh, she really is a remarkable specimen. Her brain is a gift. In another life, she might have been the next Da Vinci or Einstein, but Providence found fit to burden her with motherhood, poverty, and loss at a young age, which has crippled her over time. Her experiences are different to, wor to work around. Every now and then I'll catch fleeting images of babies and collapsing buildings on the screen and have to redirect her attention. She is resilient, though, and her mind has shown no frailty when handling such an excess of information. It is amazing to behold. Uh, the next log indicates that the deal has changed yet again, and Mr. Dark is not only satisfied with uh, seeing now, he wants to be able to look back and see through time, and uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's a little little more difficult for Anderson Robotics to pull off. Basically, said I'm not, you know, I'm an inventor, not a wizard, and uh, you know, it says even if even if we could, there's no way to do it uh, without you know killing Callisto through the extra energy that would have to be expended. Um, uh, we go to a log that indicates the miracle has occurred that. Uh, He'd been working on tuning the implants when Kaliso started acting strangely. Uh, she, you know, didn't communicate, just held out a hand. She began shuddering, and uh, truthfully, he could feel the ground moving slightly beneath his feet. She cried out several times and made many horrible sounds, but the screen illuminated, and on it was myself many years ago in the Vietnamese town where... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm switching between first and third person here. Um, Anderson... Uh, sees on the screen that uh she has successfully managed to do this remote viewing while also showing an image from the past and has absolutely no idea how Callisto has uh managed such a thing but she can she's no longer intelligible she can't speak um and uh, also points out the next day that huh there's a lot of dead animals uh around this solar array and uh he has a hypothesis that, you know, it must have been an electrical malfunction. You know, they kind of just go from there to uh, the last log, which says that we've been able to create a workable trigger. Uh, she's nearly completely mute, but responds to verbal commands and to touch. She expects my hand, and when she feels it, she will send out her farsight towards wherever I indicate. Her hair has fallen out, but I still reward her with a brush she can use to pretend to run through it. This seems to comfort her. She has deteriorated quickly, and additional modifications needed to be made. Her body is almost entirely sustained now by the solar array, being generally incapable of producing its own energy now. She no longer takes in sustenance, except in very rare cases. And additionally, all of her orifices seem to be collapsing on themselves. I thought the blistering around her mouth was some sort of rash, but the skin there seems to be coming together in a way that I did not expect. This is happening everywhere else as well, and I fear it will not be too long before she will need auditory implants in order to hear commands as well. Despite this, we're still making great strides. <laughs> so, you know, the the addition of this body horror angle 
into the rest of the work. Is it strictly necessary? No, but I think it adds a lot to the uh, the final product here. It you know it's not just enough for this person to be a conduit for remote viewing. Uh, the process is altogether terrifying and, and absolutely horrible for somebody to have to endure. Um, we go to addendum four, which is the activation logs that are written by D class, and uh, they are uh, different uh, uh, events that were recorded by D class that have appeared on the the television screen. Um, one of them says the thing is standing in a building school kids passing by eighties. Can't tell door opens and man with gun is there thing approaches the thing in this case is footnoted to be the dash B and that's all that's as far as they got in the transcript before they presumably died. Um, another one that says outside a hospital in middle East people crying loud sound thing. And this is again, dash B looking in window sound of plane then explode. And that's as far as they got. And then uh, the the last one says, uh, inside some facility, small boy on the ground, two people, guards, appear incapacitated. Boy is crying and frantically trying to put something together in a corner. Someone trying to get in the door, and the figure, and this is Dash B, is standing behind them. The boy's body starts to change, and the figure reaches down towards him, and, and it ends. So, uh, fairly vague, but tends to be uh, not not terribly good events being uh being observed here um and it's i'm I, i'm not sure if i'm supposed to take from this that uh these were sort of unbidden remote viewing sessions that uh the dash b initiated of her own volition or what because the vibe i got from the rest of it was that these were uh sort of somewhat manually uh initiated let's say by uh uh, by Vincent Anderson. So I think that is what I'm supposed to take away from that, that these are, you know, uh, her, uh, initiating of remote viewing on her own. Uh, we go to, a, uh, addendum five, which is a recovered video. And, uh, this, uh, is essentially a, uh, the reveal of Callisto and the apparatus from Vincent Anderson to Marshall Carter and Dark. Um, he refers to it as the Callisto series model zero one, which is, uh, I think, I, I think that's a great line actually, because that, you know, just, just gets across like how little he cares about her in the context of all this. She's, she's nothing but a model number in this and, uh, points out that, uh, uh, she can, she can now, uh, see retroactively and they go to, uh, uh, basically to a meeting between Marshall Carter and Dark uh, in the past so as to prove that she can definitively do this. Uh, Mr. Dark notices that uh, Callisto seems to have uh, inserted herself or superimposed herself into the video and uh, Dark asks, can they see it? Uh, and Anderson says, not uh, that we know of, no. Uh, it's just something on and Dark cuts him off uh, gets up and, uh, approaches Dash B. Anderson steps forward, but gets pushed down, uh, and Dark steps in front of Dash B, grabs her by the shoulders, and, uh, says, Ulysses Sate, you can see him, I know you can. We met once, years ago. Find that moment. Find it. And Dash B shudders, Anderson calls out, uh, one of Dark's guards hits him in the face with, uh, with the butt of his rifle, uh, the ground begins to hum, uh, in the background, something drops out of the sky, presumably a dead bird. Um, so, uh, another voice identical to the second unidentified person from the previous activation event, albeit slightly younger, is heard from the television. And, uh, we have more dialogue here. There's a link here to SCP-455. This appears to be what Dark was looking for because, uh, he then says, kill him. And he looks down at, at Dash B and says, kill him now, do it, kill him, you bitch. I can see you standing behind him. Kill him. Slaps Dash B, which recoils and begins to shake. Said, kill him, you dumb fucking whore, before he... And there is movement on the screen, and Dark takes another tentative step backwards. He is noticeably breathing heavily, and from the television, the sounds of choking can be heard. And, uh... The person says, Sate, Sate, what's happening? And Dark says, get out of the way, you dumb fucker. Let him die. Let him suffer. He deserves it for what he did. For... 
and there's the cracking sound from the television. Two armed guards on screen collapse and begin twitching on the ground. More shapes identified later as birds continue to fall from the sky, and Anderson is still rolling around on the ground uh, holding his face. The scene on the TV changes, and as it does, Dark begins to shake, and he says, What is this? No, wait, that's mother. She's, that's me. No, wait, no, 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 not like... And Dashby begins to shake violently. The rest of the security detail drops to the ground, their body shaking and smoking, and fluid beginning to seep from cracks forming in their skin. Raw red flesh is visible beneath the cracks, and it also smokes and sizzles as it is exposed to open air. Dark lunges for Dashby, but stumbles after taking a step. There's a loud wet sound followed by a scream on the television, and then another wet pop. On the ground, Dark seizes. His body flashes white briefly, and then both the audio and video cut out from uh, our uh, our addendum video log. Um, we have a, uh, another camera feed that's intermittent and uh, shows a person uh, dragging themselves toward the outer edge of the plate. And when they reach it, they crawl onto the grass and stop moving. And we go from there to uh, some more dialogue with Anderson, um, where we find that his... Uh, <laughs> This is this is good. I I, I don't want to I don't want to skip uh, too much of this, but uh, there's some things that you know you don't quite get what's going on. You go back, you're like, oh my god. Uh, so I'm gonna work work my way down, and then we'll we'll uh, re uh, <laughs> reevaluate what we just went over. Um, it's between Anderson and Dillard, and uh. You hear Anderson opening and closing drawers. He said, I, I did this to her. I created something that was cruel. She felt me. I felt her and I felt cruelty. Hate because of me, because of what I did. Uh, you know, and Diller says, what are you talking about? Where are the investors? And uh, there's a the sound of an automatic drill being used to affix something to a piece of metal. And uh, and Anderson said, this is why I was getting so tired. I, w I thought I was overworked, but she figured it out. The, the array i could feel the life coming out of me and it hurts as being replaced my energy was being replaced by the thing inside her this thing that hates and uh dillard says where where are the goddamn lights i can't see and dillard turns on the lights illuminating the interior of the laboratory and anderson he's wearing a crude steel plate with two holes for eyes and a small slit for a mouth and from behind the mask it is clear that the skin is missing from his face and his eyes are fully red so there's a sound of a, uh, there was a sound earlier of a drill being used to affix something to a piece of metal. I'm wondering if that was him drill you know uh, uh, <laughs> uh probably, right? Um we have uh uh Anderson saying she could be anywhere. She can't do it alone, not without the array, but if she does and she starts it, she can find me anywhere. She'll find me and she'll kill me. I I I felt her heart. I thought it was her ego, but or her identity, but it was hate. And, uh, and it says, we, we need to either bury this or abandon it or let the elements do something. We need to cover the array at least. Maybe that way she won't be able to use it to pull with, to pull power. And then we'll see what happens. So there's a little bit of, of explanation of, you know, we hear all the stuff about them walking on the plates and then, you know, it was buried under earth in the original recovery log. So, uh, Anderson robotics went back and covered this, uh, this, solar array to uh lessen Callisto's power and uh Anderson the drops the final line of I thought the figure on the television that appears whenever she looks somewhere was just her consciousness some kind of anchor I was wrong Isaac it was her hatred and that dumb motherfucker woke it up we go to an addendum six this is a receipt of services rendered from the offices of Messrs. Marshall Carter and Dark for the sum of $755 million that will be deposited into the account we have on file. And uh, one last activation log in addendum 7. SCP-4760 activates automatically on July 13th, 2017. A D-class is on hand and transcribes the scene on the television. The, trans the transcript reads, It's just standing out here looking at itself. End article. A lot to go over in this one. Uh, this is <laughs> th this does so many things so well. Um, I'm I'm actually surprised that the rating is all that it is right now. It's it's chilling out at about plus forty four uh, at the time of this recording. 
but this is good this int- this you know multiple GOIs that converge in a very believable way this this you know pushes both of them uh in a believable manner and there's you know very good horror elements to this that you know are you know really at at the end of the day they're what the site's about of of giving you that uh, a very unsettled feeling this article does that numerous times and it does it really well i i feel like there's there are just enough images in this to and they're all and they're really well picked there's just enough you know dialogue to get across what we need um i have condensed this quite heavily um i i always encourage you to to go back and read these but i i certainly do so uh in this instance uh this is very much worth your time to get the the full effect of the work uh this was really well done cactus easy plus one moving on we have s c p forty three twenty this is called when you look up at the sky tonight that was written by Prometheum written just yesterday uh only about uh 16 hours old at this point um one thing that i want to mention on this thing is that it makes use uh for the first part of this of updated uh procedures being indicated in blue and this doesn't honestly buy much for the piece this is uh it's not really done as a format screw it's done to sort of you know change the perception of things over time but i'm not sure i'm a fan of this format um the procedures indicate that uh, foundation web crawler 4320 is to monitor and track all mentions of and information regarding 4320 and its sub designations in order to isolate and properly monitor dash two individuals Mobile Task Force Pi-32 Moon Watcher Watchers are to seek out and gather information on Dash 2 individuals of interest to the Foundation, attempting to apprehend or recruit them if necessary, and currently we employ 37 Dash 2 individuals, including an administrator, site, uh, 19 site staff, and 13 field personnel, and 4 long-term D-class, and the Foundation is aware of the identity, personal details, and whereabouts of 13,827 more 82 of whom are known to be affiliated with major groups of interest. So one of the reasons I don't really care for this convention of making changes in blue is that we have 39 struck through and 37 replaced for the number of individuals, and then 14 struck through and 13 replaced for field personnel that are in that. But 13,827 is just there. So you need to kind of either don't do this gimmick or do it everywhere. Um... I, I if it were me I would not do it at all because I don't think it, it it's one of those anytime you do something like this that uh, is a deviation you're expected to make full use of and the article really doesn't do that um if you want to point out changes over time there's there's other better more established ways to do it um but we uh go on to say that under under no circumstances are our members of dash two to be allowed in the vicinity of dash one so um, we haven't really explained what any of this is but we go into a description that indicates that 4320 is the collective designation for two which is struck through and replaced with three separate but interconnected anomalies dash one is a major natural satellite of the earth despite being the same approximate size as the planet Mars and with an orbital semi-major axis distance only 1.72 times that of Luna, Dash 1 has no apparent effect on its surrounding celestial neighborhood, and unlike Luna, Dash 1 is not tidally locked relative to Earth. So, a second moon, but not a moon because it's the size of Mars. It's a planet that uh, is behaving as a satellite around the Earth, uh, but without any sort of gravitational pull or any effect uh, at all. Um, Dash 2 is a group of individuals comprising roughly 0.00025% of the world population. Dash 2 are defined by their ability to see Dash 1 while others cannot. And Dash 3, which is added in blue, is a humanoid civilization that inhabited Dash 1 at an indeterminate point in the past and see mission report Dash A for further information regarding Dash 3. So a lot to uh, try and keep track of here. Um, the addition that we came upon Dash 3 later. Um, and one other th- one thing that I'm noticing here, the Dash 2 
comprises roughly 0.00025% of the world's population. So if, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to do the math on that, but that's actually still a pretty high number. Um, let's see here. I, I think that's that's something like one in every 400,000 people. Um, so in a major metropolitan, you know, in, in a city of a million folks, you're going to on average have two people. So I guess that's enough to where they wouldn't necessarily interact or intersect, but uh, 400,000 people into, you know, uh, the 7 billion or so on earth, uh, that's, that's a, still a good number of folks. So I guess they're, they're all accounted for or very nearly by that 13,827 people, uh, that we've successfully identified as dash two individuals. Um, it, uh, doesn't really ever indicate how we managed that because the, uh, dash twos, uh, kind of can see dash one, the second, uh, satellite, but, uh, it doesn't really indicate how we could figure out that they could see it. But moving on, the article explains that uh, the second satellite, the Dash-1, uh, can be uh, viewed by those who are not Dash-2, um, and they'll report that it sort of appeared in their vision, but it was always there, but only at that moment did they notice it. And... Uh, any artifacts or samples taken out of its visibility radius. And it seems to be as you get closer and closer to it, you're more and more likely to be able to see it. Um, so we understand that the Dash 2's ability to see uh, this satellite, regardless of distance, appears to be genetic uh, with offspring of Dash 2 having roughly a 25% chance of being Dash 2 themselves. And carriers of the gene can also pass it on to their own offspring, now, wait a minute. We just said that. Okay, so uh, on a genetic basis, with Dash 2 offspring having a 25% chance of being Dash 2 themselves, carriers of the gene can also pass it on to their own offspring. Oh, I see. So it can skip generations. I think that's what they're trying to get at. Um, so this, yeah, this is more or less basic genetics going on here. Uh, so dash one, the satellite has an argon rich nitrogen oxygen atmosphere, similar to that of earth's and large bodies of fresh water scattered across the surface of dash one are remnants of a highly advanced humanoid civilization and no life has been detected on dash one, but robotic entities have been encountered, including what appear to be maintenance drones and the cities are perfectly livable and appear to have been lived in for thousands of years. And, uh, the drones and the cities are all dated to be between five and 10,000 years of age. And we go from this to a supplement, a video log transcript. This is what provides most of the uh, exposition for the work. Um, so we, we have a team from an MTF. Uh, it also includes a researcher that specializes in xenobiology and ancient cultures and a D class uh, who is sentenced, uh, who is selected rather, for being both Dash 2 able to see the satellite at all times and has a photographic memory. Um, we don't really expand on that, but that's, that's okay. Um, so everybody checks in, and uh, at some point during this space flight, uh, the captain. Uh, is suddenly crosses that visibility radius and can see the satellite and goes, holy shit, you know, and uh, at that point they can more or less all see it. Uh, they land and uh, note that the uh, um, the buildings are all integrated directly into the ground. Uh, it's, uh, it's metal and it's just a smooth transition from the metal ground to the metal walls of the buildings. And uh, it looks as though they're all part of a single structure and uh, nothing is labeled, and uh, they go into uh, go into the first building, and uh, it's one of these where they enter, and the area of the interior is significantly larger than the outer dimensions, and uh, they uh, look back behind them where they did have a previously solid wall. Uh, now three open archways are present, and at that point, uh, the cognito hazards uh, supplied in the visors of the helmets 
are triggered, but only on three out of five, uh, three out of five people are uh, triggered, and the other two are not. So we have a uh, hallway that they begin to go down, and uh, it's it the dial the the log indicates that the team walk through the middle archway and enter a hallway long enough that its end cannot be seen in camera feeds. The entire length of the hallway takes approximately 32 minutes to cross, but at no point does the end appear to be getting closer. Instead, a phenomenon similar to the appearance of Dash 1 in the perception of non-Dash 2 team members and the camera feeds occurs as the team reaches the end of the hallway without a discernible exit time. And upon exiting the hallway, the team enters a large dome-shaped room, the walls of which... And it ends. Uh, I feel like that was just an omission. Um, they were going to describe this and straight up forgot <laughs> without without coming back to it. Um, so we we go back into dialogue. Um, one one guy said, you know, what what happened while you were walking down the hallway? And one guy says, well, it was long as shit. Took about half an hour. And the D class says, the hell, it was only a couple minutes. And uh, the other guy says, I'm with the D class. Taking a piss would have taken longer. And uh, they were the same two that uh, didn't have their cognito hazard filter go off that said it only took a couple of minutes. And command has them check their atmosphere reserves. Um, the three that had to take half an hour are at 90.6%. The two that didn't and only had to take a minute or two uh, both read 96.9%. So uh, this command, you know, everybody's a little unsettled at that. Um, command says you've encountered some sort of spatial temporal anomaly. We're going to reiterate, proceed with extreme caution. Um, and the researcher says that he can see, uh, drawings or engravings on the walls and, uh, they begin to examine the images and, uh, we get some exposition here that, uh, they were essentially human and close enough that they could reproduce with humans. The researcher says that there are three rows. The second one looks like it's about, and the D-class says, culture. They were high, highly religious and were governed by an enlightened elite. The researcher says, how did you know that? The D-class says, know what? The researcher says, why were you selected for this mission? And command said, uh, researcher, the D-class was selected for his ability to see the moon you're standing on and for his photographic memory. The researcher takes a couple more minutes, looks around, and says, uh, command... I need you to make sure this footage is coming through all right. And we don't see any flaws with it. Why? Researcher says, we have to get out of here now. And uh, the commander says, uh, what's what's going on with you? And the researcher says, I'll tell you when we get back. Where's Butler? And the uh, the head of the MTF says, Butler? Butler's the fuck? And command says, Butler, please respond. Butler's camera feed and vital readings have halted broadcasting and the uh, MTF leader approaches the D-class and says, What the hell's happening? Where's my lieutenant? You knew that stuff about the aliens, so you know what this is, right? The D-class says, I swear to God, I don't know what you're talking about. There was never a lieutenant butler here. I've always known that about them. You guys do too. That was discovered the last time. And at this point, the D-class's feed stops broadcasting in a similar manner. And uh, they have basically t totally dematerialized and... Uh, at this point, they abort and get the hell out. And uh, there's a note at the end that says, No recording or trace of a recording history matching either Butler or the D-Class were found during debriefing. Additionally, all records of them were missing from Foundation databases. No prior knowledge of Dash 1 had taken place until this expedition, and the source of the D-Class's knowledge is still unknown. So, this was why I chose this. It's It's doing some interesting things. So we go from this to the uh, a mission findings report from the researcher that was uh, above, and it basically provides all of the remaining exposition for the story, and it explains that Dash 3, uh, the civilization that lived on this satellite, were highly advanced, ruled by an enlightened religious elite with the ability to perceive time non-linearly, and uh, it goes on to explain... Uh, m members of this civilization went to war with themselves and almost entirely destroyed their planet. Um, survivors left behind drones to keep the planet in good shape and then abandoned it and traveled to Earth. They hid their planet from prying eyes so that none could ever profit from their secrets, and they kept themselves exempt from this rule so they would never forget their own mistakes. 
They mingled with the native population of Earth, who were of their same species, or at least very similar, producing fertile offspring who could see their ancestral home too. And we know that two of these descendants were on Dash 1 during this log, and both of them, without any trace of their past or current existence, are nowhere to be found. But what we don't know is why they disappeared or where they are now. We don't know whether the D-Class knew what I was about to say before I said it, and then didn't know what I was talking about when I asked about it, uh, if it was some form of genetic memory passed down from the civilization, or was his desynchronizing from linear time and perceiving things in the wrong order, or was it something else entirely? Uh, we don't know when the civilization came to Earth. We don't know if only Dash 2 disappear on the satellite, or if they just do it faster and the Foundation are too scared to find out. They can't risk losing another one of their special D-Class. And we don't know if any uh, Dash 3 are still alive, and we don't know how long it'll take us to find out, or if it'll be too late when we do. What'll happen to make it too late? We don't know. Here's what we might know. They might be repopulating. They might be removing the last of their legacy, but who knows why they would do that. It might be a punishment, it might be a reward. This stuff gets really foggy when you get into might, so I'll leave it at that. Can't handle this project anymore. <laughs> Peace, I'm out. And, uh... They were, this researcher was reassigned to her new and current position as SCP-4976 Project Director. Oddly enough, we covered 4976 just a couple of weeks ago, and that is where we end the article. Um, there is, there is good and bad in this work. I picked it because it does some things that I haven't seen done quite this way before. Like, we've done stuff that only certain people can see. And we've done, you know, uh, aliens, you know, walk among us, but I haven't seen it combined in this way. And that's really interesting to me that, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the, the video log was really well done. It threw in just enough, you know, uh, weird stuff that it, uh, that it worked. But at the same time, there are very big flaws with the work of a structural nature things like just sort of dropping off mid log on what uh what what the room is um there 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 are issues um for sure but at the heart of this there is a really good work for now i'm no voting this um this actually does need a little bit of polish to be uh, of the standard that i think it should be because it certainly got something good going on here uh, it just needs a little more work to uh, to earn a plus one from me. Moving on, SCP-4287. This is titled P. Pigeon Esquire, and this was a co-write between uh, two staff members, uh, Reverend Fox and Zen. Uh, first thing you see when you uh, look at the skip is an image block on the right side, and it uh, is of a pigeon, which we probably could have guessed. Uh, it is uh, your standard uh, rock dove. Uh, and the subtitle reads uh, 4287, seated at the Site 48 boardroom, mediating a discussion. <laughs> so uh, we have an object class of Euclid and containment procedures that uh, state that 4287 is permitted a primary resting berth in the Site 48 secondary break room and allowed a daily allotment of assorted prepackaged snack foods and fresh fruits from the adjacent cafeteria. And each afternoon, it is to be provided with one cosmopolitan cocktail. And there's a footnote for cosmopolitan, and it says all proper office workers in a high end company firm should know their way around a proper mixed drink. You never know when an intern may become an agent who may need to make cocktails for their boss, date night guest, mother-in-law, girlfriend, sister, or undercover assassination target. Per my extensive research, the Cosmopolitan is a highly popular mixed drink. And then it says, a uh, full explanation and five pages of documentation available on request. And it's signed, P. Pigeon Esquire. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, we, uh, we, we go on down and it says that uh, until uh, <laughs> there's, there's these footnotes everywhere and they're all signed by the pigeon. Um, the uh, Due to it being a pigeon and not being able uh, to get around all terribly far, uh, it's permitted free access to any areas within Site 48 so long as it remains localized to one facility and wears a tracking device. 
Uh, level 2 personnel are permitted and encouraged to pick up 4287 and carry it around to assist it with desired location changes for increased efficiency. For increased efficiency also has a footnote, and that reads, I assure you it is the best and most logical solution given my stature and range of dexterity. And it's signed P. Pigeon Esquire. Um, and until the skip has provided a finalized plan for the placement of recycling bins within Site 48, it is to be allowed direct access to all recycling receptacles for proper fecal deposit, and instances of Dash 1 are to be deposited in the same on-site recycling receptacles. So, so those are our procedures, and the description indicates that it is, in fact, an adult male rock pigeon of average size and weight with blue-gray feathers and black banding around its backside. It refuses to or is unable to take flight. 4287 clearly displays signs of sentience that struck through and it reads sapience and there's a footnote here it says sentience is not enough for my level of intelligence and communication does nobody know the difference between sentient and sapient anymore and that's signed p bigeon esquire <laughs> that's really good because that's actually that's a common thing that we have to fix in drafts is making sure people understand the difference between sentience and sapience um <laughs> it's able to communicate verbally with Foundation personnel in fluent English, albeit interspersed with typical non-anomalous pigeon behavior, including spontaneous defecation. It speaks in a Brooklyn accent unless it is being directly interviewed by Foundation personnel, at which time its accent will change to a vaguely British accent. Now, the, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a good amount of uh, European skippers. We've got Scottish, Irish, English, Northern Irish... Welsh, we've got them all, and I'm going to say almost every one of them would be offended by uh, saying vaguely British accent. That that accent is all over the place. Uh, anywhere you go on the aisles, it, it's a little different. So I might change that. I might just give a, you know, specify. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. I know the, the point you want to get across, so, you know, the, the accent that most people... Uh, here in America would think of would be like a Londoner accent. So maybe just go with that instead of uh, saying something like vaguely British. The pigeon is apparently quite skilled in industrial organization, office management, and clerical work. Uh, and it will offer advice uh, whether or not they request its services. It can also spontaneously manifest in a boardroom and makes use of this ability to disrupt board meetings, insisting on acting as a moderator for the discussion or identifying typos and grammatical errors on presentation materials. It's noted that it can't transport out of the boardrooms and must be carried. It is also able to anomalously consume large quantities of paper and cardstock material. Its waste, correspondingly, is composed of compressed dry paper material in the shape of pellets, hereafter referred to as Dash 1, and Dash 1 instances are propelled from its rear with sufficient force to cause immediate explosive decompression upon impact. <laughs> uh, so, wow. Um, we have a... Uh, goodness. Um, we have the initial uh, interview log where they try to figure out who the hell sent you here, Like, and it turns out it was an intern. Um and we go to the a second addendum, which has a list of site-wide policy changes involving the pigeon. And uh, these are basically requests that the foundation is, you know, either accepting or denying much in the style of older Series 1 works. And uh, the, the pigeon requests an allocation of at least 10 Level 1 interns to provide specialized transportation assistance for P. Pigeon Esquire throughout the designated areas of Site 48. This was accepted. It asks for... The immediate relocation of pigeon-friendly foodstuffs from Cafeteria A3 to the adjacent secondary break room. Routine reminders to Foundation personnel making use of the aforementioned areas that they are not to consume items that do not belong to them and they have no claim to. This request is denied. Your request involves the purchase and installation of a new refrigeration unit, which is not cost-effective. However, we will place a sign directing people away from your food. So... We have, uh, you know, several more of these, and <laughs> one of these includes, uh, due to the increase of paper material present in Recycling Area 1, requisition of 10 Energy Star compliant, low energy 12 watt LED bulbs to be installed to alleviate the potential fire risk. Cost analysis has been performed, and it is concluded that this investment will also reduce the overall energy cost of Site 48 by several hundred dollars per month. Please find said cost analysis document attached. This is provisionally accepted subject to revision following the fiscal department's process uh, processing of the 20-page cost analysis document. Um, 
So we, we have a few more of these that uh, the pigeon also wants a mobile recycling receptacle to increase efficiency of uh, poop disposal. And uh, there's, there's a rebuttal and uh, the foundation kind of meets, meets the pigeon halfway. And that is where we end the article. <laughs> this is one of it's it's silly but it's it's not it's never so wacky that it's outright like a, a dash j article it's just you know it's <laughs> it, it, it now i'll i will say it's it's quite a fine line but it, it does pretty well uh this this is a uh, thoroughly entertaining without being uh without being even you know re- remotely scary or, or creepy I, I think my favorite thing about this is that the pigeon is offering unsolicited advice. Um, if you've worked in an office setting, um, you might be familiar with this guy or girl that uh, kind of sticks their nose in everything and and makes requests for shit that has absolutely nothing to do with them. Um, they have the appearance to spontaneously show up at these meetings and give great ideas. Uh, I'm sure um, that's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's one of those, there's, you're, you're, there's not a ton to unpack here, uh, but this is, this is good. This is entertaining. I, I did enjoy it. And this is an easy plus one. Moving on SCP 4606. This is titled Deimos and it was written by Mac Warren. This is my second long boy of the week. This one's just as good sized as 4760. If, uh, if not longer, it's awfully close. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to condense this in a bit more. There's a lot of dialogue that I'm going to uh give you the gist of and we'll we'll keep it moving first thing you notice when you open up 4606 is there's no skip here (laughs) Um, what you have is a thing that says by order of the overseer council the following files are level five classified non-authorized access is forbidden and what we have instead are three collapsibles that say please enter appropriate credentials to access file one file two and file three So we begin with file one, and that is the beginning of the SCP format. Uh, We have an object class of Thaumio and a picture to the right of a white male, middle-aged, maybe a little little younger than middle-aged, and it reads SCP-4606, circa 1918. Uh, This is uh, a uh, black and white, and it says picture received courtesy of 053. And... uh, so we have our item number, object class of Thaumiel, and procedures that indicate that due to the contractual agreements aligned in addendum 4606.1, 4606 is free to roam Site-17 and interact with on-site personnel. And when not roaming, it's contained within a low-security humanoid containment domicile furnished with standard amenities. Additionally, it has requested these items, uh, which include a monthly subscription to certain magazines, a notepad, a fountain pen, a carpet... Uh, several novels that have been written by Poe, Stephen King, and Lovecraft, and a television with cable, and when roaming, a tracker is to be placed around its wrist and securely fastened. And that pretty much wraps it up for the procedures. Um, The description indicates that 4606 is a Class 9 reality-altering polymorphic humanoid entity currently named Dean and was previously known as Deimos, the god of terror in Greek mythology. I love this. Uh, I, I love any time we've got a picture of a god and he just looks like a like a white dude and he's asking for novels and cable TV. Uh, the article indicates that Deimos has taken uh, various identity shapes and forms over the years, and some of these have included a red, skinless, skeletal humanoid with pinprick eyes and hair, a large, dark mass of human arms and legs with multiple bloodshot eyes in the center, an M4 Sherman tank with mutilated nude corpses draped and bleeding across the surface, and a tall winged humanoid with a single large eye on its head. And it is capable of creating ex- extra-dimensional entryways into a pocket dimension. And we have a picture just to the right of this of what looks like cracked asphalt. And it says, uh, Formation of trans-dimensional space by 4606 on an asphalt concrete surface. And uh, we go from there uh into an addendum this is an interview transcript uh dated february 12 2013 between uh we'll call him dean because that is apparently his name right now and 053 um the thing that strikes you in this uh dialogue is that 053 and 4606 are very obviously good friends and not just good friends but longtime friends um you know 
uh, the skip calling 053 kid and saying, you know, good to see you, kid. Been too long. And uh, basically, uh, 4606 is looking for a job. Uh, we pick that up over the the next two interviews. They want something to do. Um, he's grown tired of, of the world and what it has to offer. Um, he, he's been many things and has done a lot, but he's been limiting himself for far too long for such simple tasks. So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's the score right now. He's look, looking for work. And, uh, we have an 05, uh, Overwatch command meeting, uh, a video log. I find this very hard to believe that, uh, they would record such things on video, but, uh, we'll proceed anyway. Um, and this this involves quite a few of them uh, over the course of this dialogue. Um, my my favorite my my favorite line is uh, is O five nine saying three is a dirty fucking liar. Cut him loose. Uh, that uh, as as three is trying to explain the the state of things. That uh, he's an old friend from the past, way before my birth, and he wants to talk to you all. Um, uh it goes on um honestly this is i don't know that this actually gives a lot to the work you could have probably left this this entire log out but uh he basically you know three being the mediator for the rest of the o5s and sort of going to bat for for dean and uh making you know getting them on board with it and they acquiesce uh suspiciously easily um and i say and i i don't mean that to indicate that there's a twist coming up because there's really uh not but just that it's it, it falls a little short of believable with how quickly this all transpires from one saying he's a dirty fucking liar cut him loose to all right we'll see how loyal he is to us and if he gets out of line he's sent to a cold cell in 81 so we go to a third addendum that uh includes a list of anomalies affected by 4606 this includes uh things as recent as scp 4450 which we actually just covered a couple weeks ago um that uh it, it shows 4606 going to work and uh being you know the god of terror and uh roughing up uh chris and barrel from 4450 and uh we have logs including uh, Abel 0762. Got logs including 682. Um, all of these things where 4606 is kicking ass and taking names and being a very effective uh, servant for the foundation. And that's where we end the first file. And the second file, uh, the addendum uh, one, includes the uh, a brief, uh, the abridged contract and it uh the demands outlined by the skip include full roaming privileges uh outside the chamber but within the confines of the site full interaction between staff and handlers and requests for various items and objects within reason we accepted all of those and demands outlined by the overseer council include full compliance with orders given full servitude and loyalty to the council and scp foundation and restricted access and interaction with any anomalous objects and individuals unless ordered by the council and these were all agreed upon by the skip and this contract expires in five thousand years we have a second addendum that's a log between uh, the D class uh, of note from SCP 2669, the big bad, and uh, 4606. And 4606 uh, decidedly has the upper hand in this interaction. And that wraps up file two. Uh, file three is ancillary information recovered from the journals of 053 during his service in World War II. And uh, it starts off on August 12th. It doesn't give a year, um, but, you know, you presume this is World War II. You can, you know, take take your pick um, from the relevant time. Um, three indicates that he saw him again on the field. He can only peer from the trench when he threw his gun at one of the soldiers and the gun went all the way through his face and came out the other end. Um, bullets came hailing from the nests at the north edge and hit him. And they came whizzing past so fast they decimated the dead trees and none of them even put a dent in him. Not sure anything could dent him this way. Anything at all. 
Uh, he turned into that giant bat thing and took out the nests. We moved cautiously, mostly out of intimidation for him. And five days later, there's another entry that says that he calls himself Dean. Uh, he offered me a drink in the pub and asked me to join him. Uh, he gulped down three, three mugs in less than a minute. And, uh, uh, three tries an icebreaker with him and says, what, what brings you to the unit? Why did you join? He said, good Lord. He went on this lengthy drunken tirade on how in his heyday, he was a God among men. People would pray in his name. He'd go off on his adventures with the Greeks, Greek, this Greek, that apparently he left his pantheon after monotheism kicked in and forced him to retire. And this made him pick up odd jobs ever since, or something like that. So this guy isn't only a shape-shifting abomination with a drinking problem, he's also an immortal god with a drinking problem. <laughs> so uh, we uh, have uh, uh, one more of these uh, building up Dean's backstory, and it is very much out of the Greek pantheon. Um, uh, one thing of note is that he left his dad to his work, his mom left him for their pantheon, and his brother is nowhere to be found. He wants to bring him back together, he just doesn't know where to start. And, uh, I'd asked if there was anything I could do to help. And he just laughed and said, kid, maybe after this little war, you can help me around. So it looks like I owe him a favor for his help back there in the trench. And lastly, we have a letter sent from Dean to 053 dated 1953. And it says, Hey kid, long time no see. So I've been thinking a lot of what to do after all this is over. I spent a lot of time sitting on it. And I think that being a soldier isn't the best fit for me. I know now that I'm not a fighter. I don't fight for a cause, especially one that isn't mine. Well, I only enlisted just to make my dad proud. I hope that if he could see me, he could see that I did my best. I'm not really cut out for this whole soldier patriot crap. I just want to do things on my own, live my own life and all that hubbub. I saw my brother a while back. He was happy. I saw him watching this horrible flick. Terrible effects, abysmal settings, awful concept, and don't even get me started on the monster itself. That thing looked like a monkey that was crossed with a fishbowl. But he was happy. I saw him terrorize some of the folks inside. Got a laugh out of me that my own brother is doing what he does best. Scaring the living daylights out of people for gaffs. I'd send you another letter for the address, but I think you and your people already know where he is. Main Street, I think. Goodbye, kid. Take care of my brother for me. He's the only family I've got left. And it's signed, Dean. End article. That, that ending is intentionally left just a little vague. And... I am fairly certain that is a link to SCP-2006. That was a very high-ranking skip in the 2000 contest, which, Jesus Christ, was almost five years ago now. Um, I really liked this. Um, for taking something as inscrutable as a god of terror and making him a Thaumiel seems like a tall order. I think this skip actually did really well at that. Um, for it being a cliche con entry, it nailed a lot of things out roams the site freely and uh, uh, all that good stuff. But uh, for the most part, this is made up of uh, of reasonably good dialogue for Dean, less reasonably good dialogue from the O fives. Um, that that's still sticking out to me as the the weak link in the work. Um, but that said, still really good. Um, have no problems giving this uh, a plus one. And uh, I like the little, uh, the, the cross testing in here. Like when you cross test with 682, you do so at your peril. Um, in this case, it's built up slowly enough. And the reasoning is logical enough that I'm not, you know, mortally offended by the inclusion. So uh, no, this is well done. And I think that actually speaks a lot to the work that you can cross test with 682 and get away with it cross test with able and get away with it this got away with it this was a good skip last but not least scp 4985 this is titled high finance and it was written by modern major general um, first thing you notice when you look at the skip is a very tall image block and it is of a high-rise building, and the subtitle reads uh, SCP-4985 Headquarters, Manhattan. Um, I'm a little bummed I don't know my Manhattan skyline well enough to say uh, what this building is. It's quite large. I'm sure it's a prominent uh, structure in Manhattan. I just couldn't for the life of me tell you what it is. The procedures indicate that 4985 maintains a significant public profile, so full Foundation custody is infeasible at this time. So we have containment measures that uh, 
revolve around managing public access to the offices and 4985 affected persons, altering news reports to remove references to anomalous activity and regulating corporate activities of 4985 to limit its influence, particularly with regard to investments in companies that are directly relevant to foundation operations. Uh, the foundation maintains an embassy of four staff at 4985 who are tasked with relaying communications to and from representing the foundation in negotiations, promoting commercial and cultural exchanges, and ensuring compliance with the treaty and all other agreements, and knowledge of diplomatic negotiations, business administrations, financial markets, and the history of Europe in the Middle Ages are desirable. <laughs> uh, all staff interacting with 4985 employees or their immediate families require a cognito hazard resistance value greater than 50. And, uh, the description indicates that 4985 is the Zoller and Sons Company, an investment man management firm based in New York. It is a privately held corporation operating mainly in leveraged buyouts, growth capital, and venture capital with approximately 400 direct employees and $30.5 billion in assets. And the company has cognito hazardous properties affecting its employees, shareholders, and their immediate families, both in the legal and biological definitions where they are influenced to accept and participate in its unorthodox organization and corporate culture. Uh, this culture includes things like a uh, hereditary family-based hiring practices, uh, frequent use of internal and external violence, and a variety of rituals and etiquette rules followed by its members, as a result, the operation approximates that of a European monarchy of the late Middle Ages. The functions of the board chairman and CEO are combined in its ruler, Dash 1. The current Dash 1 is Mr. Peter Lawrence, who styles himself as King Peter I. Dash 1 was born in Pennsylvania in 1975 and began working for the company in 1997 after completing an MBA at Cornell University, eventually reaching the position of High Lord of Global Credit and Duke of PetSmart. <laughs> that line is why I included this in, in this week, by the way. Duke of PetSmart. Uh, we have a footnote by Duke of PetSmart. It says, titles of noble rank are awarded based on the size of 4985 investments, which are analogous to vassals. As one of the largest corporations wholly owned by 4985, the PetSmart Ducal title is one of the most prestigious. <laughs> uh, he assumed leadership after the financial crisis in 2008, after assembling a coalition of shareholders to overthrow the then ruler. As a result of this precarious ascension to the throne, he's pursued a cautious internal policy, but relatively aggressive external policy, securing a marriage alliance with Merrill Lynch <laughs> in order to escalate the ongoing conflict between SCP-4985 and Clayton, Duvillier, and Rice. Uh, the U.S. Foods War, the footnote reads, where CDNR prevented 4985's acquisition of that corporation, which it continues to consider its rightful territory. <laughs> this is delightful. Uh, given the hereditary structure of the organization, uh, there's mobility at lower levels of of the chain, but uh, uh, being awarded a noble title is infeasible for the majority of, of employees unless they distinguish themselves in battle or especially shrewd investments. Either or. Uh, the most dramatic effect of 4985 is its use of capital punishment. Between 5 and 10 employees are executed by beheading per year for crimes such as embezzlement and lese majeste. Uh, they've also occasionally committed violent acts on people outside of the org, uh, including the attempted poisoning of several mid-level Morgan Stanley employees and the defenestration of two SEC investigators in 2009. And this is what led us to being aware of the anomalous organization in the first place. Uh, despite all that, the... Uh, the corporation remains competitive, uh, does does pretty damn well, and uh, provides financial services to over 2,000 uh, non-anomalous individual and corporate clients. It maintains close relations with U.S. state and federal representatives. And uh, as a degree, uh, I'm sorry, as a result, a degree of flexibility and creativity in containment and foundation SCP-4985 relations has been required. And we go into an addendum is the event transcript between... Uh, the uh, a foundation uh, doctor and uh, the various staff within 4985 and I, i'm gonna gloss over some of this because it's, it's quite a long uh quite a long uh, transcript but suffice it to say pretty much the entire thing from the position of the zoller and sons employees is done in uh 
sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's supposed to be like uh, Middle Ages sort of speak uh, that begins with the receptionist saying, state your name and business, Outlander. And our Dr. Gonzalez says, I am here for a 930 meeting. Luis Gonzalez of the Public Corporate Society, Senior Vice President. The receptionist says, uh, my deepest apologies, noble Lord Gonzalez. As a newcomer to our realm, your likeness was not in the database. Your forgiveness for this inconvenience, please. I will inform the Count of your arrival. He picks up the phone. He says, Your Excellency, the foreign lord from the society has arrived. Of course, Your Excellency. Hangs it up. He will receive you shortly, sire. Please be seated. So I will go right next to this. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, the guy that introduces himself as Michael of House West, Lord of Public Relations, Count of Grubhub, at your service. <laughs> So uh, we have, uh, basically, our doctor has been given an audience with the king. Um, I, I, I'm i going to stop right now. You need to read this. 4985. You need to read this this addendum, this transcript. It's really good. Um, so we uh, we brought some wine as tribute. Uh, and uh, But apparently, you know, got to make sure it's the right kind of wine. And, and, and it apparently is. And that prompts our, our you know... Uh, our aide here to say, well, thank the Dow. I feared it was a Napa Valley. Um, so we go to meet Dash One, you know, the the Lord of, of Zoller and Sons, and uh, we start off on, on shaky ground because we mentioned that we, you know, have close ties with the U.S. government, and uh, a, a courtier in the in the crowd says, a commission spy! <laughs> we have a shouting of insults towards federals and regulators, and... Uh, we have uh, the final line of this is from the king. He says, an interesting proposal. I would discuss this with you further. All but the Duke Yankee Candle and Count Grubhub leave us. And the transcript ends. Uh, I, I I don't know why this tickles me so much. Probably because it's just, it's 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 entertaining. This is, I, I haven't seen it presented this way. Um, the, the Duke Yankee Candle, the Count Grubhub, the, the Duke of PetSmart. Uh, so we go from this, you know, this dialogue to a second addendum where we hammer out the Treaty of the Hamptons and it contains provisions about establishing our foundation embassy, uh, non-interference from Zoller and Sons in our subcontractor corporations. Um, we must divest our assets from CDNR, who this company is embroiled in a war with. Uh, non-aggression between the two of us and advance notice of any military actions or major financial decisions on the part of 4985. Um, we were hoping to cease violent actions against other members of the finance industry, but that's uh, not yet been successful because uh, the perception is that it's a threat to its uh, independence, its sovereignty, and its prestige. And this continues to be an area of containment interest with a suggestion to, revis to revisit this area of negotiations in return for extracting further concessions from foundation congressional contacts favorable to 4985. This proposal is currently pending ethics committee review and article. Like I said, this, this just tickled the hell out of me. Um, this idea of within this building on that you would see on the Manhattan skyline and within it is a company that carries itself with all the regal elegance of uh, something I would have built in Crusader Kings 2. <laughs> it, it just, I love it. Uh, and that not only do they, you know, carry that regal demeanor, but they have these landed titles granted to things like Yankee Candle and Grubhub. Um, it's bizarre. It's not not particularly creepy, uh, but it's, it's bizarre enough that it makes you, what the, what the hell's going on? And, but, oh, but when you think about it in those terms, are you, are you ever fully immersed in this? Not really. Um, you know, that, that could definitely be a knock against it that yes, I'm, I'm very entertained by it. I'm not really drawn to it or compelled by it in terms of being a work in the SCP universe, but nonetheless, it's still very entertaining. Um, this is, uh, you know, they're not all the skips are going to put a man on the moon and they're not, you know, going to be, uh, the most dramatic thing you read that day, but this is still, uh, still an outstanding work. Um, I, I actually, I enjoy this, I think more than most people will enjoy it. It, 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 uh, amuses me in all of the right ways. Uh, that 
uh, is enough for me to give this a plus one. And with that, that's a wrap on week five. Uh, this one flew by, not the least of which because I've been doing better in actually closing out all my ways where I would interact with people during the actual recording of these things. I appreciate you guys. You, you know that, but I got to get these things over with faster. I've, I had one of these run on till freaking one in the morning trying to get these put out. So uh, it's about 10 minutes to seven. I'm going to put this out. Hopefully be about, you know, eight thirty nine 9 o'clock mountain time by the time you uh, get your ears on this and uh, hope you enjoy um, we'll be back next Friday for week six. Um, if you have not joined or have not uh, gotten the memo, we do have an IRC channel for SCP Cafe on Sin IRC. Uh, the channel is simply SCP Cafe. Um, be sure to subscribe, as I mentioned back at the beginning. Uh, we're available on Spy to- SpyTunes. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> we're available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and of course on the website at scp.cafe. Until next week, uh, keep reading, keep writing. We'll see you on the other side.